Good day, and welcome to IMPACT, a community affairs program of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. I'm Jeff Frederick. If the pillars of a society are the legal, governmental, and economic structures that provide the framework of daily life, the holes in between that provide meaning, symbolism, comfort, reflection, they're filled by culture. Over 35,000 museums of all types dot the landscape nationally and give patrons an opportunity to see and learn, to do and examine, and to contemplate that which stitches society together in common experience. Art, in particular, is critical. We know from scientific research that exposure to works of art builds memory and creativity, relieves stress, accentuates imagination, and fosters brain development. We need more of all of that. Did you know that from 1912 to 1948, Olympic medals were given out for sporting-inspired works of art in architecture, music, painting, sculpture, and literature? And one need not journey to Raleigh or Atlanta, Chicago, New York, or Los Angeles to see great art. Southeastern North Carolina features many artists working in many different mediums. Today we focus on the vibrant art scene in Scotland in Robeson County. And later, we'll hear from two UNC Pembroke faculty who can take us inside the artist process and also help us to learn how to interpret and just how to enjoy various works of art. Joining me today, first of all, are Aaron Rembert and Vanessa Abernathy. And a little later, we'll talk to Carla Rooks and Richard Gay. Welcome. Thank you. Aaron, tell me what's going on with the arts community in Scotland County. Well, I think people would be surprised that there is as much going on in Scotland County as there is. We just finished a great summer of youth camps. Um, we filled them up both times that we had them this summer. The kids were excited to be there. We had kids from ages six on up to middle school. So we had a great group of kids. Um, we welcomed the new Poet Laureate to Scotland County just last week. The annual Storytelling Festival of Carolina along with regional music happens in October. We have adult art series happening every month. Um, we have our music series starting up. There's just a lot really happening all over Scotland County that we've got our hands in. It sounds awesome. Vanessa, tell me about what's going on in Robinson County. Well, as you know, Robinson County is one of the largest counties in the state. And as a result, we have several different art presenters. For instance, we have Carolina Civic Center, uh, GPAC. Uh, we have several different uh, groups like uh, Purple Door Productions, uh, Inner Peace Gallery. And so we also offer uh, the Robinson County Museum, History Museum, and they all have activities that will be going on during the holiday period and on to the new year. For instance, uh, Jumbo Jam, which is pre presented by Jumbo Arts International, will be happening October the 13th. Uh, in January, the Arts Council will be presenting uh, Twelfth Night. And as you know, the presenters will also be providing uh, entertainment with uh, the Christmas shows. And uh, each of the individual towns, we have at least seven major towns in the, in the county that will be providing Christmas uh, parades. And so wherever you go in Robinson County, you're going to find art, art activities, and lots of fun and entertainment. So there's so much programming and so many events going on in both counties, um, probably way more than people would have understood. How do you make connections with artists, both local, regional, and national, to let them know about some of the kinds of things that they could participate in? Well, some of our programs um, have happened for a long time. So the artists themselves that have visited with us and shared their talents with us are telling other artists, hey, you know, Scotland County is a great place to be. You want to go there, you want to share. Um, we're also reaching out to musicians that may be on a bigger tour in our area. We're looking for them to be, come and be able to do their show right here in Scotland County so that people aren't having to leave home. We have so many amazing uh, local visual artists. We're trying to reach out to them, get them to show their work, do classes, um, word of mouth, um, you know, putting it out there what we're doing and having the people come to see these performers and these shows and wanting to come back is really what's keeping our artists coming back and starting to find us instead of us always seeking for them. Once you make your reputation and people know that you are an arts welcoming community, people find you, right? They do. Yeah. And people want to show their work and they want to perform and they want an audience. And so 
being a smaller community in a smaller county, getting people to come out and see these incredibly talented artists right in their own backyard um, really has helped us fill the audiences and get people coming out for classes and asking and for what's next and you know sharing what they want to see. So that's helped us be able to expand our programming to include things that maybe we wouldn't have thought of um, as a community. Same thing going on in Robeson. People get to know a regular calendar where certain activities will come and they just know. Yes, uh, the Lumberton Visitors Bureau does offer a, a regular calendar in terms of what's happening in Robeson County. And more importantly, we at the Arts Council are developing two major projects. One is called River Voices, where we try to emphasize the musical aspects or musical talent in the county. And we, again, we use our seven major towns to feature those, those events. We've also started a program called uh, Seven Sisters, where we're concentrating on the visual arts in hopes that we can identify and increase the number of visual artists that are known throughout Robinson County. So we want to give them exposure, and more importantly, we want to find them, identify them, and uh, hopefully spread the good word about their music, their talent, their art, uh, throughout Robinson County and the state of North Carolina. Let's talk a little bit about inspiration. You both have talked about so many different kinds of artists and so many different kinds of mediums. What are some common grounds, some common threads that seem to inspire the artists who are working so prolifically in your areas? Well, I think they're inspired by having a place that supports them and a place that they can show their work, um, knowing that they're not out just doing it on their own, that there are people that want to see them or hear them or whatever the case may be. I think that um, just having the local people appreciate, the people in your hometown appreciate and um, recognize what you're doing uh, keeps them supporting us and in the community. You know, there's been a variety of different studies to talk about the economic impact of the arts. And I know Robson County just uh, was a part of a, of a lengthy uh, study on just that. Talk about how arts are not just good for people's souls and for weaving them together in a, in a common culture, but how they are, the, the arts make good economic sense. Absolutely. Uh, as you know, uh, any, every time you have an arts event, concert, play, uh, not only uh, are the artists themselves paid for their, their work, but the uh, building itself is paid, the uh, ticket takers are paid, uh, if you have sets that are, are painted, then not only are those uh, technicians that paint the sets, the hardware store that, that sells the paints uh, gets paid. Uh, if folk need to eat after an event, mm -hmm. the local restaurants, they are able to uh, get some remuneration as a result of that. Uh, and so uh, everyone that's associated with arts and culture at some point in the chain, in the food chain, has an opportunity to get something economically out of that event. I think it's important fact that people forget that it's not just a play, it's that people are coming to town to go to dinner first, they're driving in, they're getting gas at the gas stations, they may see a shop that's open that they want to take a peek into, and so they're really supporting a whole area and the people by having an event um, that's art related. In addition, what happens when, when someone attends an art event, they, are, they stay in that location a little longer than they normally would. And so in addition to the restaurants and the local shops, there's an opportunity for our hotels to also uh, uh, get some type of benefit from those arts events. Let me give you a chance to make a real argument because in an era of declining resources when there's never enough funds to do everything a community might want to do, sometimes what gets cut first are music programs or art programs or drama programs. Talk to our people who are listening right now. Why should communities invest in the arts? Well, there's several, several studies that have been done in terms of the impact, the psychological and social impact of arts and culture on an individual. For instance, uh, something as simple as uh, drawing can help relax a person and take some of the stress away. Uh, sometimes something as simple as being a musician or uh, studying music can help you with the sciences. And so there are, there are organizations and uh, universities that like to 
like to uh, get students that have musical backgrounds or uh, art backgrounds because it also helps them with their studies. Yeah, the focus that is drawn from the creative outlets really has been shown time and time again to help kids um, keep their reading at the same level, not going into what they call the summer slide. Um, having them have those creative outlets increases their focus on math and sciences and gives the brain a different way of working um, so that when it comes back to the traditional math, science, um, they're, they're refreshed almost and able to concentrate better on those. So we love having getting our kids involved in stuff early. Um, I think our schools in Scotland County still have art in them. Um, it's important for them to stay in those programs, um, to come out and visit us in the camps and in the weekend projects and in family art nights and really kind of engage everybody so that they have that well-rounded foundational in their education and in their brains. I mean, to keep it operating in different ways than just the standard math and science and reading and writing. and. So a community that invests in the arts is actually investing in its people. It and really we all certainly need that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned kids. Um, when should grandparents and parents start exposing their kids to art? How should they start developing technique? What kinds of programs do you have to get people from the earliest parts of their life to get interested and fascinated by art? I think the earlier the better. Um, I think you can do any type of, you know, coloring with your tiniest grandkids, playing with Play-Doh, and then when there are programs available, we do youth art camps all the time. Um, we started in the last couple of years doing family art nights so that the kids are in there engaging with their parents, um, you know, showing their creativity together as a family and being able to work on projects together, um, showing what they like and um, keeping the family unit together pushing through those projects. It was uh, very interesting uh, during this uh, most recent hurricane, I was so excited to see um, information posted on Facebook about all the different activities families can do with their children while they're out of school. And it's amazing, uh, something as simple as a paper plate and some crayons and the, the types of things you could actually make with the with the materials that, that you can be found that can be found right home, at home, and so I was excited to see that. Um, I'm hoping that a lot of parents saw something there that they could use. Um, not only does art help them in terms of their cognitive thinking, but it also helps them later on in life when they decide to apply, employ, apply for a job. Uh, so how, if people are interested in finding out more about the art scene in Scotland and Robinson County, how can they get more information? How can they contact you? Uh, we love our social media. We have our Facebook. We do our Instagram. They can look at our website. Um, call us on the phone, or we just love visitors to stop by. That's actually how Vanessa and I met, as she just stopped in one day. Uh, we met a couple of years ago, and it was just kind of a, you know, she was spreading the word about the programs he she had, and we were able to talk and kind of share some ideas. and. Um, create this collaborative network of, hey, there's somebody I can reach out to. So, and how about the Robinson County Arts Council? How will people find you? Well, we have a website and we also have Facebook. And of course, uh, you know, just attend some of our events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, Vanessa, this has been great. Thank you so much. Now we'll take a brief break and we'll come back with Dr. Richard Gay and Carla Rokes. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No you, problem. You guys are great. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. We couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. So they say it's a man's world? Well, I don't see any 
anybody's name on it. While they were out doing their thing, we slowly changed all that. We changed all that! Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at. And welcome back to Impact. Professor Carla Rokes and Dr. Richard Gay are with us. Carla, you're a prolific artist working in lots of different mediums. Tell us a little bit about how, how artists envision their work and then how they turn it into reality. Well, uh, generally the creative process starts with some level of inspiration, usually going out to visit museums or galleries, looking at other works of art, uh, talking to other artists or working with artists. And then there's an um, the ideation phase where you know, the ideas ruminate for a while when you begin the process. Uh, and the process is the funnest part because it's all about um, playing with materials and, you know, working with that flow state where you just go into the making phase. And Richard, you're an art historian, so um, walk us through a little bit about how uh, you put art in a context of a time period or a type of expression. And then let's talk a little bit about how all the rest of us who aren't as uh, skilled in understanding art can just learn to appreciate it and interpret it a bit. Well, art historians take many different approaches and historically have addressed works of art in a variety of ways. Um, early on, many art historians were focused on the life of the artist and, and learning about uh, the, who created the work of art and what their lives were like. And, and art historians can approach works of art from many, many different angles. And I tell my students that we're only limited by the types of questions that we ask of the work of art and our resources that we can find to answer those. So there's really um, a, almost an unlimited number of things that we can ask. There's the traditional things about what media is it made out of, who produced it, who, is it, who it was produced for. But many of us like to explore how that object functions within the culture that produced it. Um, how it engages, engaged with the, the people who were viewing it to create uh, an atmosphere and a meaning. Uh, many uh, times we think of a work of art as a reflection of the time that produced it, and that is certainly true, but it, the, the objects of art are also um, powerful ways of communication and can also in, very much uh, uh, impact uh, the culture that uh, created it as well, so it's not like a passive object that we're just observing. For the everyday viewer to uh, appreciate a work of art, that's unlimited as well. I mean, uh, you can find works of art uh, on any subject that you're interested in. So if you're interested in sports, you can find works of art about sports. But one of the things I always encourage people to do is to take time to look at original works of art. So frequently we are bombarded with images, lots of reproductions, and there's nothing like actually standing in front of an actual work, work of art, not a reproduction of the piece, to get a, a sense of what it's like. You can see things that you just can't see in the reproductions. So I always ask people to go take a look at original works of art to, to, uh, to acquire appreciation for them. Well, we're going to look at some stuff here in just a minute, but before yeah. we do, both of you reference time, so I just want to follow up on a couple of questions and I know no uh, two pieces of art that you would create or make are the same but how how when do you know that you're satisfied with something how much time does it take to get you to a point where you're like I think this is done right. well you, you don't usually give yourself a set amount of time the work tells you when it's done um, basically you you move through the process and then you look at the work constantly and evaluate it based on your knowledge of the media and composition, and then it just comes together. And so time is kind of irrelevant in terms of, it, it could take years to make a painting or it could take hours or minutes. And Richard, every time you look at one of these great works of art that you referenced at looking at original art, do you see something a little bit different each time? Most definitely, if I take time to slow down and appreciate it. That's one of the, the things that I'd like to stress too, is that people need to slow down and look at a work of art. 
Uh, again, we're so bombarded with images, it's easy to glance at it and think we've seen it, but we really haven't taken time to e evaluate it. One of my favorite paintings is um, um, by Rosie van der Weyden. It's a d deposition altarpiece, and I've seen it many, many times in reproductions and in classes. And I visited the Museum of the Prado, and I saw it, and I, I reckon I saw so many things that I had mm -hmm. never encountered before because I was in front of the original object and I was able to slow down and, and look very, very carefully. So yes, I see new things in works of art all the time because I'm constantly asking new questions about those works of art. Well, let's take a look a little bit of some footage now of um, our art gallery right here on campus and we'll spend a few minutes uh, envisioning that. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Well, this is a faculty exhibition at the UNCP, and we're looking at a work by Austin Shepard. He is a UNCP graduate who went on to get his MFA, uh, and he's a sculptor, and we're seeing a general view of the gallery there. So um, when you put exhibitions together um, of work by various artists, how does that come together in such a way that the works of art build upon each other or complement each other? There's usually a th theme involved, some kind of thematic direction that the gallery director um, puts together and then they, they examine the work to see how it speaks together or works together and, and then they curate the show, hanging it in a certain way so that it has a flow and, it, and that the work speaks to each other. There's a dialogue, visual dialogue. So. And you've put sh shows together like I this. have put shows together uh, here in our own gallery, but I have a museum background and I have some experience working on large exhibitions. And when you go to a major museum, there's a, an, an enormous crew that is working behind the scenes to get the show to the gallery. They're the, the curators who will work to select the works of art, but many of the works have to be acquired through loans. So there's negotiations that take place with the repositories that have the work. Uh, that own the work and then th there's of course the preps that uh, put the stuff on the wall and the, the people who insure it and the travel it from one location to the other. So there's it takes a lot of a work. Village. It mm -hmm. takes a village to get this done. But in terms of selecting things, it can be uh, images of uh, a retrospective of uh, an artist. So you show works from different times in their career or it could be related around a specific theme or subject. I, I did a show once on uh, the Virgin Mary and, and illuminated manuscripts and so I picked out key elements that were important to viewers of the manuscripts in previous periods such as the, the Virgin Mary as, 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 as a virgin or as a giving mother or as an intercessor and I selected works of art that would illustrate those points to the public. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, still images and uh, I'd like to see, hear both of your perspectives on uh, things that I should notice. This is Pretty famous work of art. Oh uh, well, yeah, this yeah. is a famous, famous. work of art. Uh, <laughs> I believe everyone would recognize this work. This is the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. It was produced in the Renaissance period around 1503 to 1506. Some people say it couldn't have been started until after 1513. Others say it wasn't finished until 1517. So it's, a, it's an early piece. But this, this is a work that many people would question, who's the sitter? And we call it the Mona Lisa, and we believe it could very well be Lisa Giardini, who is the wife of Francesco de Gioconda. Um, but that is questioned, and so art historians uh, seek uh, research and evidence to either prove or disprove the identity of the sitter. We're also curious about who commissioned the work. Uh, we assume that uh, it was commissioned by her husband, a silk merchant, Francesco, but that is in, quite, in fact questioned as well. We know that Leonardo da Vinci produced a painting of uh, Lisa, but uh, we're not necessarily certain that that's the work. Mm. So, so there's some detective work involved There's a lot here. of detective yeah. work involved, and part of the fun is the search. If we could put that back up uh, for just a second, Carla, I'd love to hear your uh, perspective on a working artist mm -hmm. in terms of what speaks to you about the technique and the skill. Okay. And sure. Well, the technique involved, um, it's an oil painting on wood panel, and it involved 30 very thin layers of paint. Um, he was very meticulous, and back in the Renaissance era, of course, painters, uh, there was a certain alchemy to their, their paint. They had to uh, create their own paint and their own method. They had their own recipe. So da Vinci really um, perfected his glazing technique by this time. And so he used a technique called the sfumato technique, where um, color and tone were gradu gradually blend together to create these very soft transitions. And so that creates a sense of realism. The light uh, is reflected off the skin in a way that uh, makes it seem very soft and real. And then the shadows, of course, are also developed. Um, and the composition also is 
Very strong uh, Renaissance artists often use geometric forms in their composition. So you can see the uh, implied triangle above her head is the, the tip of the triangle and it goes down diagonally across her arms and uh, the base is at the bottom. Um, and it's very symmetrical. However, there's a slight shift to the left, but her gaze, her enigmatic gaze pulls you right back to the right. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's, uh, She's very uh, mysterious, <laughs> uh, and I think that's what's held our interest for so long is, is her gaze and her smile, which isn't quite full. One of the things that um, we uh, look at when we look at these works of art is uh, the idea of preservation. And uh, often when people look at that, my students ask the question about, what about her eyebrows? She doesn't seem to have eyebrows. Well, we uh, believe that, in fact, she did have eyebrows. But the, the work had been cleaned in the early 19th century, and we mm. believe that it perhaps had been a little bit uh, zealous. Mm -hmm. They'd been a little bit zealous in their right. cleaning, so there was some evidence that there, there, there could have been eyebrows. We also know that there are other uh, copies of this work that were produced in earlier periods that show an image with an individual with, with eyebrows. So there's a lot of uh, layers to this work for sure. Yeah, there were notes in the Uffizi Gallery that say she had these beautiful eyelashes and eyebrows, and that um, they were probably removed through primitive uh, cleaning techniques. So a, a work evolves in one way or another mm -hmm. over time. No question, and she's had some repair works done to her. Mm -hmm. Her elbows had a little bit of work done to it, and so often when we're in a museum and we see these, these pristine looking works of art, they've often had a little bit of uh, uh, work done to improve their, their uh, uh, peel on the wall, so to speak. So uh, she's very well preserved. There's actually a crack on the panel. Uh, Carla mentioned that it's on a, a popular, popular panel. Mm -hmm. There's actually a little crack behind her that's had to been, uh, re be repaired. And so there, she's had a little work done to her, but she's looking pretty good for a 500-year-old. No wedding. doubt, yeah. no doubt. I think we might have time to look at one more. Um, uh, so very briefly, take a look at uh, this next image and g give us just one thing that stands out. Well, this is um, done by... Devorah Sharber. Devorah Sharber, and she is an artist who's playing with the idea of perception. And so it's based on uh, pixelation, essentially, where an image is broken down into tiny colors of square uh, patterning. And so she's using, her visual element is spools of thread and she's inverted it on the wall mm. so that when you stand back, it seems like an abstract image, but seen through this kind of ocular device, it does what the eye does, right? The optical lens yeah. and, and inverts the image. And you see here the face of Mona Lisa. So she's playing and with perception. It's a great example of how uh, the history of art can inform contemporary art. This is an artist who's active today, and she's looking to the past to inform art that she's producing in the present. And it's also very interesting, too, the use of the optics in this work is something that I believe Leonardo da Vinci would have been very interested in because, as we know, he was an inventor science. and a scientist and was interested in how the human eye functioned. And so great, great stuff. Exactly. Thank you both very much, and to Aaron and to Vanessa as well. Join us again for the next edition of Impact.